I want to thank everyone for coming to our annual uh, Sunset Supper. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, the dinner. We had a wonderful non-rainy night. Um, and uh, we have a very special speaker tonight. Yes. Tom Daly is a lifelong resident of the area. Um, and uh, he's, his, his vocation has been photography, history. He has literally hundreds of thousands of slides on the area. And he's going to share some of the great ones with us tonight and talk about some of the estates, uh, at the great estates of Ryan Beck. So let's get going. Mm -hmm. Tom Daly. Thank you very much. We're going to uh, tour some of the biggest states in the valley, and I've been asked to kind of start in Statsburg because in Statsburg, the Rhinebeck Historical Society had their uh, annual picnic this uh, past fall. We're at the entryway to the Ogden Mills Estate. <clears throat> I've been around here a long time, and I will tell you that the Ogden Mills Estate had beautiful iron gates uh, at both entryways. They were taken down many years ago, and uh, Unfortunately, uh, they're sitting over in front of a barn with a, a worn out tarp over them. They're just rusting away, but those are the beautiful eagles. <clears throat> he made, made his money by selling picks and shovels to the miners. And uh, then he became a, a banker as well, and he came uh, to the east here, and uh, he, he fell in love with Ruth Livingston. The Livingstons were aristocracy, uh, at least they thought they were, and uh, they owned uh, loads of property, but they had uh, very little funding to take care of it. And so Mrs. Mills really wanted uh, to be, uh, she was a competitor for the queen of the 400 club, which Caroline Astor ran. So uh, now she had the money to uh, do what she wanted. And so they had a beautiful Greek Revival small house on the property. Uh, Stanford White designed a mansion and built it right over top of that house. You'll see lots of portraits in the house. They're all portraits of the Livingstons. There's no portraits uh, uh, of the Mills family. It's just a photograph or two here and there. But the house is beautifully decorated, as you can see here, for Christmas. The uh, hallway and, and the main part of the room that you walk into was part of the old part of the house, and uh, it's all done in quartered oak. Here we have a, a picture with a Christmas tree uh, that goes up uh, all the way to the ceiling of the second floor. There's a, a portrait on the wall of, of the daughter. Her name was really Gladys. She did not like to be called Gladys, and so she told everybody that she wanted everyone to call her Gladys. So, <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> this is Mrs. Mills' uh, uh, room where she wrote her notes and uh, gave orders to the servants and so forth. And you can see the beautiful mantelpiece, the color of the marble, and notice the gilded uh, faces and designs that are into it. This is all part of the gilded age, and you'll see it everywhere. Now, I point out to you the grain of the marble, how beautiful it is. That's bronze, all gilded in gold. It's pegged into the mantelpiece. There are a lot of uh, wonderful oriental vases uh, in, in the house. And so uh, about three months ago, the state of New York said there'll be no more photography in this house because uh, the Chinese are trying to lay claim to a lot of these uh, pieces that were taken, brought to this country years ago illegally. Anyway, this is the, the dining room. It's all done in green marble, marble floors. It's all gilded ceilings. It's a huge room, absolutely huge. This is the, uh, the uh, table uh, at, at Christmas time. Uh, the, the folks came here for Christmas, and uh, they had different homes. They had a large home in Paris, France. Uh, they owned a beautiful uh, mansion out on the cliffs of Newport, Rhode Island. And Christmas time, they would come here, and they would invite their guests. And sometimes, being part of that society, they had to invite people that they didn't like. So as a result of it, Sometimes uh, Mrs. Mills had a way of getting even with people. She might invite a lady she really didn't like, and she would punish her by sitting her in the center of that table and then seating someone on each side of her that she didn't like. <laughs> so as a result of it, uh, she had no one to talk to because she couldn't see who was across the table, as you can see. This particular year was all done in a wisteria design, so they recreated these designs. Here's another year. You have the regular Christmas trees right on the table. You can see the big glass windows. You're looking right down across the grassy slopes. It's one of the few properties that the railroad does not uh, bisect the river uh, from the mansion itself. Here we have the place setting, and uh, you can see uh, the menus to the left of each one. And it uh, served several courses, so uh, the person who was on had to go through this for a long period of time, because it took a long time to serve the meal here. 
they raised cantaloupes in their greenhouses, and so they liked to boast of that, and they had them in time so that they could uh, pick them at Christmas time and put them on the table. This is the library. It's an equally uh, big room on the other side of the house. And these are some of the wonderful porcelains. And, and you can see the books are all in cases here. And this is probably one of the most important things in the house, in my opinion. It happens to be a Hudson River artist uh, by the name of Albert Bierstadt who created this beautiful scene. You can see the Indians on the pony, the reflections in the pond, and the beautiful sky. It's typical of his paintings. He did large paintings. A few years ago, they decided they finally, the friends of the Mills Mansion raised enough funds to uh, redo Mrs. Mills' bedroom. And so uh, the silk damask was rotting off the walls and so forth. And so it was all stripped right down and redone, put back together again. And so this is what it looks like today. There's a, a firm by the name of Scalamandre who does the uh, reproduction of that, that beautiful silk damask on the walls. So they're able to recreate it all. This is a stairway we're going up. And so I always tell people when I take them up the stairs to be sure to look uh, up at the ceiling because there's some beautiful things to be seen. Now you see, once again, we have what's called uh, faux work here. This is not wood, it's plaster. You can see the plaster is coming through because there's a big water tank that stores water up over the ceiling. But uh, part of the reason for this was the fact that now the rich could brag of the fact that it costs more money to do it by faux work than it would to, to carve it out of the wood. So it's all part of the game. But anyway, the ceiling has these beautiful uh, uh, canvases on them. Uh, and you'll see these wonderful things. I picked them off the ceiling so you get a very close look at them. And so that's what I tell people, you know, when I take them through the house, you have to look up and down and around and take your time. There's so much beauty to be seen here. But here's one of the many sconces on the wall. Notice the face at the, at the base of it here. We'll take a little closer look at this. It looks like the god of fertility here. We've got the, the grapes and so forth. And, but look at the grain of the marble, how beautiful it is. It's absolutely exquisite. And if you think you're being stared at, you are. This is up on the ceiling. There's faces looking down on you, watching you. And notice, once again, the gold gilt is uh, everywhere. Here we have more gold gilt on the tables. And this is the only thing I've seen uh, of the mills uh, side of the family. There's a, a picture of the Mills' uh, son. I believe he was uh, the Secretary of the Treasury under the Herbert Hoover administration since quite a number of years ago. And this is the house that was on the site that uh, Stanford White decided to build right over top of it. Now, this was the second house on the site. This was put up uh, uh, somewhere around 1830. The uh, original house burned to the ground. And this is what it looked like when he got finished kind of resembles the White House. It looks to me like something you'd see in the British countryside if you traveled through England and looked at some of the vast estates. But now we're looking up the drive of the uh, Dinsmore Estate, and this is where we had our wonderful uh, picnic this year. And you can see the daffodils uh, bloom everywhere. The lawns are covered with them in the springtime. Uh, this is, you know, I have to tell you, I, I grew up uh, as a little boy on, on Ferncliff, uh, the estate that belonged to Vincent Astor, and uh, it was the same way. There were, there were daffodils everywhere when I was a kid. You just could go out in the spring and pick them no matter where you went. The fields were just filled with them. But anyway, here's the original mansion that stood on the site. It supposedly was a 92-room Hudson River sort of bracketed mansion with what was called a Chinese pagoda tower on the top of it. It was an immense house. And this is just a, an engraving from Smith's History of Dutchess County from back in 1881. And here's some detailing of uh, what the house looked like. You can see the big balcony up on the, uh, on the top there. You can see the window hoods, all things of that particular period. The rounded top windows gives it a little bit of Italian flavor. It's got bay windows to bring the light in. And there's that beautiful tower, so you can imagine the vistas you would have had. Well, it's unfortunate because when Vincent Astor's wife uh, divorced, she bought her great aunt's house, which was uh, the Dinsmore house, and uh, she wasn't about to live in a 92-room mansion, and so she had it demolished, and uh, the antiques were uh, sold. They had a big auction. Things were scattered all over. Some of the mantelpieces and architectural features were taken out of the house and stored down in the barn complex. This is what the house looked like from the riverside. So you sat on that veranda looking down across the lawn right at the Hudson River. And it was called the Locust. This is what replaced it. Um, uh, 
This is uh, an ex-Mrs. Astor built uh, this beautiful house on its site. It is a very beautiful house. It's nowhere near as large as what was there. Um, I, I consider it to be sort of Baroque. And this is why I do that when you see these uh, various designs and things on the facade of the house. This is an older photograph that was taken uh, before it's been beautifully restored by the current ownership. Uh, this uh, is right after Mr. Guccione, who owned Penthouse Magazine, uh, unfortunately had to relinquish the property. And this is the vista that you have from the swimming pool looking right out across the Hudson River. Now, I'll tell you, I got those photographs because I stopped one day. I, I read about the fact he'd lost the property and it had been to an auction. There were men working at the front gate, and so I stopped to talk with them. And uh, I asked the gentleman if I could have permission to go up and take a few photographs of the house. I'd never been up to the house. And he said, I'm going to give you permission to do that. And he said, um, uh, you know why I'm giving you permission? And I said, no, not really. He said, because you're the only one that asked. <laughs> He said, I'm up there all the time, all day long, chasing people off the property. He said, I just came back from there, chased a man and his daughter off the property. And they had the nerve to say to me, oh, we thought this was the Ogden Mills house. And he said, no, it's not the Ogden Mills house. And they said, oh, is this house for sale? Well, they knew exactly where they were and what they were doing. Anyway, it had these wonderful garden things, of uh, uh, follies and, and patios uh, scattered around. This one is still there. Uh, it had a a place to sit on it, and you could look at it uh, across the river from these places. At one time, it had the largest uh, formal gardens of a private estate in America. The trees that you see that are all pruned were brought here from Ferncliff uh, by Mrs. Astor when uh, she uh, divorced her husband, Vincent. And here are the great barns that are on the property. They're absolutely huge, and the current owners are in the process of beautiful restoration here. Uh, they got that wonderful board and batten running up and down, and uh, you can see the cloverleaf windows, sort of quadrophile or cloverleaf, whatever you like to call them. And uh, notice the beautiful little air vents up on the top, the little cupolas with the weather vanes on them. Under Mr. Guccione's ownership, he didn't have the money to maintain them, and they began to fall in, and so they lost a, they lost a large part of their barn, com barn complex, and most people don't realize uh, what was really there, but I'm going to give you a peek. Up in the stables, this is what I meant about architectural things out of the mansion. Well, there it is. There's one of the mantelpieces out of the, the original mansion. There was pieces all throughout that uh, barn complex. Take a close look at it, because here it is in the auction hall in Red Hook. You see, it, it came down. Uh, they brought all that stuff down, and they sold it at auction, at Cole's Auction House in Red Hook. Mr. Guccione uh, had beautiful antiques. Uh, I like the kid a little bit. As you can see, look at how beautiful this piece is. And uh, he had good taste in antiquities as well as he did women, because as you know, he published Penthouse Magazine. <laughs> anyway, uh, they, they used to make butter. They had prize cattle here. They used to make butter. And there's the old butter churn that was down in the butter house. There's a big uh, tunnel that runs back into the ground where they stored the butter that was shipped uh, by railroad uh, down to New York City. And this is another one of the smaller buildings. This one still stands uh, in ruins. It hasn't fallen in yet. This one is on state property. The state uh, acquired a large piece of, of uh, the property next door. Here's one of the old barns taken years ago. It has been, uh, a new roof was put on it. It had holes in the roof when I first saw it. And here's one of the barns that they lost. The only thing standing is that silo uh, and that one wall is still holding it up. It's still there. Now, the left side of the barn, uh, when I saw that and took this photograph and developed it, I went back about a, a week or 10 days later to get another one. It lay on the ground because it had a big thunderstorm, and the wind hit it like a sail and pulled it right over. Here's another one of beautiful barns. As you can see, it's just collapsing. The roof's fell, falling in on this one. These are beautiful buildings, some of the most beautiful barns I've seen here in the valley. This one is a real beauty. I've blown this up into a 20 by 30 uh, and, and sold it in the gallery a couple of times. People just love that photograph. Anyway, the only barn that was ever restored is this one. It was uh, uh, restored for a hunting club, uh, apparently, and uh, it's what was called the piggery. This is where they raised pigs years ago on the estate. We're going to just jump up to Lydic Hoyt's estate. This is what it looked like. Uh, it's a, it was a design that was done uh, by uh, Calvert Vox. Uh, it uh, was uh, built back in the 1850s. It stands in ruins today. 
Here's the house uh, many, many years ago. The state of New York boarded it up and ripped off all the verandas and so forth. And uh, vandals continued to break into the house and they stole all the mantelpieces and uh, the stairway and the newel post and they took just about everything. But it, it's a very beautiful house and it, it does this house does have uh, uh, good news because uh, the Calvert Vux Association uh, has uh, acquired the rights to uh, restore this house with the permission of New York State and so they just uh, raised a, a grant of $300,000 to replace the slate roof on the house. And here's a wonderful vista of that house uh, many years ago before they tore the verandas and so forth off. The veranda, by the way, ran all the way around the house at one time. It's in Statsburg. It adjoins the Ogden Mills property. It's uh, part of the state of New York parkland. This is what they did to the interior. I just show you this one simple mantelpiece, but uh, there were elegant ones in there, and I photographed them before they, they all got torn apart. But the vandals went in, and they just they were nasty, na absolutely nasty. And here it is kind of overgrown. And there was a house next door. Uh, believe it or not, and this was the Lee Mansion. It was just up the road from it. Uh, the property adjoined it, and uh, it was being occupied by uh, children uh, who were, were going to uh, a, a school uh, in Statsburg. And uh, as a result of it, uh, they left a lighted cigarette in the bed one morning, and the place exploded and completely was gutted, and so it was demolished. Now we're standing at the entryway to Linwood. Uh, there was a beautiful mansion uh, on this particular property. Uh, the fire department was hired to uh, burn it to the ground uh, because the Catholic Church, the Sisters of St. Ursula, I believe, purchased it. They had a beautiful uh, old mansion over in Roundout, and it was not big enough, and so uh, they acquired this property. The house was wooden. Here's a picture postcard. And they did allow the public to come in and, and take anything they wanted, so people were in there stripping mantles and so forth. And uh, unfortunately, I, I lived on the other side of the river at that time. I didn't get to see that happen. But this is what they, the beautiful building that they built. It's modern, of course, but it, it's what's there. And so, hey, uh, it, it, uh, it, it's kind of a retreat center today. And it has beautiful ancient plantings of trees on it. And here's an example of what you see on the bank here. And it's got one of the most beautiful vistas of, of the Hudson River. So if, you're, if you drive down that particular road, be sure to drive into the property and just take a look around. Anyway, we're going to come to Willerstein next. Uh, this is Willerstein uh, back about uh, 1980, roughly, before it was uh, the restoration was started on the house. <clears throat> and if you listen to Daisy Suckley, she would tell you it was painted last in 1910, but the paint was good, and uh, that's why it lasted so long. She was a marvelous lady. Everybody loved Daisy Suckley, but this is what that old house looked like. It was kind of like a haunted house. It's got that beautiful five-story circular tower. Actually, the original house was built about 1850, and uh, it was a, an Italian villa, small with a flat roof on it. And uh, when Mr. Sookley, Robert Sookley, inherited the property, he suddenly realized his father was a millionaire, and he didn't even know it. And so as a result of it, he started to spend the money. He hired a local architect from Poughkeepsie, New York, whose name was Arnott Cannon. Arnott Cannon uh, was popular in the valley here. Uh, I, I, pro I think probably the nicest thing he ever did was a hotel called the Palatine Hotel in the city of Newburgh. It was one of the most famous Victorian hostilleries in Newburgh. It had beautiful stained glass windows going up, and it had a stairway that went all the way up about 10 flights with an observation. Unfortunately, the urban renewal plans in Newburgh uh, demolished it back uh, about 1975. Anyway, here you can see the restoration taking place. It's probably one of the finest uh, restoration jobs that, that I've seen here in the Valley. They have really worked hard to uh, make the money and uh, to get the grants and to uh, fulfill the commitment they have here. But uh, you can see here they're working on the tower. It was the first thing that was painted and done. They replaced the slate roofs, and the house is all painted now. Uh, it's completely done. Uh, the the uh, veranda has all been uh, repaired and the port of the only thing I, I tell people there that I won't be happy though until I see the shutters back on, so I'm waiting for that. But anyway, here's the wonderful finial. It was up on the, the roof of the tower. It was taken down and redone and put back up again. And here's kind of what you see happening here. This part of the front part of the house has all been restored here in this photograph. And there's a picture of Daisy Soakley. Her name was Margaret Suckley, and I believe she was a, a well, she was a distant cousin of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, I believe it was a second, seventh cousin, but I'm not sure of that. But anyway, she uh, raised the dog Fowler, 
that was given to the president uh, so many years ago. Here we have the house at Christmas time. Uh, you walk in, that's the stairway going up. You can see the stained glass windows going up the stairs. This once again is all done in quartered oak, which means that wood was sawed at, a gra at an angle to bring out the fine grain in it. You can see the uh, griffins and the, and the uh, hand irons in the, in the uh, fireplace here. And there's a sample of some of those beautiful windows. Uh, one by one, they have been taken down. Some of them in, have been relitted and put back together again. It's a very costly process because when I was out there years ago working, the first one they did was about $5,000, and I'm sure it's a lot more money to do it today. But look at the jewels in that window. It's just magnificent. And here's the centerpiece. I have, I have many favorite properties on the Hudson River, but Wilderstein has always been one of my favorites. Uh, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful place, and uh, I love the people who work there. They take such pride in, in uh, their, their ability to uh, accomplish what they have. Here's the library. It's all done. I'm sorry, the dining room. It's all done in mahogany. The ceiling, the floor, the wood, the pocket doors. Here's some of the detailing from that wood. You can see just how beautiful it is. It's like a tapestry material on the wall. It's done in wool and cotton. And it has stained glass windows in it as well. And this one has a particular one I put up because it has the circly crest in it, the cross with the stag mm -hmm. over the top of it. And you can see all the jewels in the window. Here we have that beautiful mahogany mantelpiece. So we have a, a beautiful tea set. I, I'm sorry to tell you that was stolen. Someone broke in one winter. They cut a panel out of the bottom of the door. They carried some pillowcases in, and they went underneath the wiring. They knew where the systems were, because they'd been obviously tourists at the house at one time. And they stuffed the pillowcases with that Sterling uh, Tiffany's silverware and other pieces from the house and took a Tiffany lamp. We're looking in the mirror, uh, reflecting uh, the, back of the room through that uh, particular mirror in the dining room. This is a white and gold room. Uh, it was a reception room. Uh, up until uh, recent years, it had no electricity in it. You can see all the candles in the sconces and the chandelier as well. And look at the designs. That's what I tell people, you know, you have to take your time and look because there's so much beauty to be seen here. Just look at the wonderful uh, carvings in this wood. The mantelpiece is absolutely magnificent, and uh, so as, as a result of it, uh, the furniture uh, was made uh, to match the architecture of the room. We have a coffin, sort of, uh, I call them coffins in the wall, and they were used for what you see here, or they put statues in them back in those days. You can see the silk, the mask here on the walls as well. And here's a reflection of the ceiling in the uh, mirror over the mantelpiece. And this is that beautiful, <coughs> beautiful ceiling uh, with a beautiful painting on it. It's done by H. Siddons Mowbray. It's my understanding that this is one of his first commissions, and as a result of it, uh, many of the other elite uh, uh, commissioned him to do uh, paintings in the houses as well. And I, I believe he also did something, uh, one of the paintings in the University Club in New York. plaster freeze up around the light fixtures here. This is a beautiful room. This house, by the way, was done, the interiors were done in the Queen Anne style. Uh, that meant each room uh, was done in a, a different period. But here's a close-up of that Tiffany lamp. It was taken quite a number of years ago now. Here we have the, the rest of the parlor, the mantelpiece. Beautiful tapestry-like materials on the wall here. The Steinway piano in the corner. And so we move quickly upstairs. Uh, this is Margaret Suckley's bedroom. It was in the tower overlooking the uh, Hudson River. You could look across to the west side or up and down the river. This is supposedly the room in which the leather suitcases were found under her bed with all the diaries of uh, her lifetime, especially taking in that period with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. She was known as his closest companion. 
There was a man by the name of Jeffrey Ward who took those diaries, uh, correlated them, and published a book called My Closest mm -hmm. Companion. But for those of you, uh, uh, unfortunately, we can't get up into the attic nowadays because it's not safe. There's only one way up there and because of fire. They don't let people up. But this is what I saw uh, many years ago. It was scattered all over the attic like you'd find in these old houses. Today, everything has been um, or organized and, and been through and neatly stacked, and they have uh, plastic wraps over everything to protect it. Uh, when I first came here, there were pots all over the floor because the roof was leaking like a sieve and it was collecting the waters. But this is the stairway in uh, that attic uh, out in the tower part of it. You can see it's all done in wainscoting. And so we're going to walk up that spiral staircase and this is the vistas that the people got. So you see the landscape here was done by Calvert Vox as well. And so we're looking all the way down the Hudson River towards the point. And these are the stables. Uh, efforts are trying to be made to raise funds for this, but uh, it's going to cost an awful lot of money. I think the estimates now run somewhere around $5 million to redo this building, and so it's going to be a tough struggle. But I hope they succeed because it's a, it's a beautiful piece of architecture. You can see the horse uh, up on the, on the top of the weather vane there. Uh, hunters used to shoot at us. There's a couple of holes in the poor thing. Those are what are called onion-shaped domes. And here's a carved wooden horse up in the peak of that building. <clears throat> so if you go to Wilderstein, walk down around the stables and you'll see all these wonderful things. Don't hurry. Take your time, folks. And here it is with a red bud. This is Chinese red bud. It's in full bloom in the springtime. These are all part of uh, Calvert Bucks' landscape plans. And by the way, they have Wilderstein is fortunate. <clears throat> they have all the landscape plans. Uh, they know where the plants were purchased and how much they paid for them, and uh, they have all the maps and, and original architectural drawings here. Now we're going uh, down to a property called Ellerslie. <clears throat> These are the main gates. Uh, well, it was one of the entryways to Ellerslie. There were two entryways, but uh, this particular one, uh, these gates were taken down and given to Wilderstein, and they're, they're down on their property right now. This was the landscape. Uh, it was uh, known by a lot of Rhinebeck residents years ago as Cardinal Farley Military Academy. It's a beautiful mansion. It was built in 1888, and the same time that Wilderstein was uh, being enlarged into what you see it today. Richard Morris Hunt, a competitor of uh, Stanford White, uh, was uh, commissioned to do this uh, particular building. Unfortunately, somewhere around 1955, once again, the kids left the cigarette on the bed and it went up in flames and I, I, it just burned right completely to the ground. <clears throat> Here's something I've been able to copy from something, uh, showing what it looked like inside. These houses were really something. And these were the barns that were on that property. They burned to the ground also, had a spectacular fire probably 50 years ago. It's a long, long time. But you can see the Hudson River flows right behind them there. Now we're just going down the road a piece, <clears throat> or we're uh, at a property called Ankeny. People uh, walk by the road, private road there. I don't have any photographs of Ankeny. It was torn down about 40 years ago. It was a marvelous Greek revival mansion. It was named after an Indian chief whose name was Ankeny. The barns are still there. They date back to the late 1840s. Here's some of the smaller barns on the property. And here we have some of the prize cattle. I like to include them. People see me along the road shooting cows, and uh, <laughs> I just love to do that. They, they, they like to pose. They're nosy. They come right up to you. Anyway, we're uh, uh, around Rhinebeck now, so we're at a property called Grassmere. It was originally built by the Livingstons. Oh, that's an old photograph. Montgomery's. Mon I'm sorry, you're right. The Montgomery's, but they were related to the Livingston's. And uh, this one goes back quite a ways because uh, this is my 1982 Chrysler Fifth Avenue sitting in the front yard the day I went to photograph it. Here we have the back of the house. This house, original, that original house, was, I, I believe, had a fire in it. It was uh, completely gutted but rebuilt again by the Montgomery family. The Montgomery family decided that Mrs. Montgomery wanted a house on the river, so that they created Montgomery Place. 
Here we have one of the elegant uh, marble mantelpieces. I, I think this house was redone a few times, and uh, Mr. Crosby was one of the uh, millionaire owners back in those days, and I think he put a lot of these mantelpieces in here. This particular one is very beautiful. This house operated sort of like a commune for uh, a group of families, and uh, now I believe it's back into private ownership again. And now we're going to go down on River Road to a property called Leacote. This was the gatehouse at Leacote, uh, belonged to the Merritt family. And you can see the, known, uh, the name engraved in stone here. It was originally called the Meadows. The Merritts named it uh, Leacote was purchased, uh, actually, Ruskin Suckley owned the property. It was sold to the Wainwright brothers, who's the Civil War general, I believe, and uh, he sold it to the Merritt family. Uh, one of the sons of the Merritts who occupied Lenhurst Castle in Terrytown uh, purchased the property. And this is looking down this roadway uh, many years ago, the main entrance to it. So we're going to go back in the past. Uh, the fifth photographs you're about to see were photographed by May back about 1970, roughly, or 69, somewhere back in that vintage. And uh, lots of stories go with it because I trespassed a few times to do it. But uh, this road went right down by the stables. It had a uh, uh, place for the horses, it had accommodations for the grooms. This is one of the wonderful old uh, farmhouses on the property down uh, uh, near that stable. You can see it's a very early house. It's got the board and batten going up and down. There's even a window hood on that left-hand bottom window. It's got that unusual roof. And here's the mansion as I saw it. It's a beautiful house. Uh, it's obviously it's Gothic in stone. This is what it looked like from the backyard. Now, I trespassed down there with a friend of mine one day, and uh, we went back and walked around the house, and the back door was wide open. And so uh, opportunities come. And so I walked in, and I wasn't in the house five minutes, and I saw a reflection on the wall, and there was a car coming up the front of the house. And the gates were locked when I came down in, so I, I had no idea anybody even came down in there. But obviously, it was a caretaker. And so we, my friend and I kind of uh, hid in the shadows, and. Uh, the caretaker turned his car around and, and went back out again, never got out to look at the house. So I went back in and very quickly scoffed up, there's a handful of what I saw. The house could have been restored, unfortunately it was let go too far and someone set it on fire. But uh, look at the beautiful mantelpiece, the parquet floors. Probably some of the original wallpaper was hidden behind a painting or a mantel. Uh, unfortunately they painted the stone mantelpiece, you don't paint stone uh, with the terracottas in it. but. You know, she got chair railings, picture picture frame railings. And this was the kitchen. It's almost like they walked away, left the coffee pots on the stove, the toaster and uh, so forth on the table. See the big stove in the fireplace. Here we have the stairway that went all the way up to the, to the attic. You can see the trash all over the floor. I have to tell you, I'm very sorry that I didn't take the time. I was afraid of getting hollered at and left. but. There were papers and photographs all over the floor, and I'm so sorry I didn't pick some of it up because, uh, you know, there were photographs of family members and uh, private papers, and it was just scattered all over the place. It was unbelievable. But we're on the second floor now. You can see the bay window, and notice it's got pocket doors uh, to close it off. The bathroom was like someone just walked away from it. And the mat's still hanging on the bathtub, the little tile floors. People say to me, Tom, how come you took all these photographs? And I said, I can't stop when I get going. But look at what you see. This is what I found uh, a few years later. I read about it in the paper and went down in there, and this is what I found. And the only way that could have happened, uh, I'm sure the vandals set it on fire. But before it was set on fire, it remained empty for many years, and so the, the thieves came and they stole uh, all the mantelpieces and they, they uh, you know, graffiti the walls, and he just ruined it. Here's the old barns. My uncle worked for Mrs. Merritt, and uh, he lived in that skate house at the end of the drive that I first showed when we came in. He took care of the farm for Mrs. Merritt back in those days. And it even had its own greenhouse on the property. The Merritt family who lived here, by the way, are all buried in the, uh, uh, in the 
example, it's called Terrytown, uh, the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Terrytown, and the old family plot. A couple last look at the house here, the wonderful drive under Portica Share here. The little diamond panes of glass in the windows. Probably had finials on the rooftop at one time. And I know that wonderful veranda was added somewhere about 1890. It had a big swing on the end of it. It's an amazing, amazing house. So, you know, this is a value of photography because we bring back to life. We stop time. I slipped this in here. It's not, it's not right in the vicinity, but I just had a couple of spaces left. And I thought I'd show it to you. It's the old house that Eleanor Roosevelt grew up in, the old Hall Estate up in Tivoli. So I just popped, I think, three photographs in here. It's a beautiful, it's, uh, built, built about 1874. It's built in that uh, Second Empire style. And just a sample of a uh, mantelpiece with the designs, as you saw in that other house, Grassmere. And here's one of those beautiful mantelpieces. Just give me a second, I'll change the tray here. Thank you. Okay, we're going to Ropey. We're standing at the main entryway to Ropey. Uh, it was built, uh, actually the original house was built by General Armstrong and uh, William Backhouse Astor uh, purchased it. Here we have the charming little gatehouse taken many years ago. And uh, by uh, telling you to be sure to look at everything notice in the iron gates, WBA, William, Backhouse, Astor. Here's what that beautiful mansion looks like back there. It's, uh, it was uh, somewhere in the 1850s. It was more than doubled in size once again. And uh, it's got that big uh, third floor added to it and the big servant's wing on the back. And uh, it's, it's just a gigantic, beautiful, beautiful house. It still belongs to the descendants of the Astor family. Here's some of the detailing on the uh, front veranda. Mr. Astor married uh, General Armstrong's daughter and then acquired the property. So this is the main door uh, where you would go in. There's beautiful frescoes on the, on the walls on each side of this veranda. In the hallway is this beautiful piece of car furniture. I just love it. It's magnificent. and. Uh, taking the time to capture all the detailing off of it. Uh, I understand it came out of Laura Delano's townhouse in uh, New York, was moved here. This is some of the furnishings and things that you see inside the house. It was remodeled several times, and I believe even Stanford White uh, did some of the last remodeling here. This beautiful gilded table of, a, of the Gilded Age is just magnificent. And I was out there, uh, Hudson River Heritage had a program there uh, about two years ago. And I was out there, they had someone in the room, went to Holder and said I could take all the photographs I wanted. And so uh, they had a cover over that table. And I bent over to look under the table. And uh, this lady in charge of the room came running over. She said, what in the world are you looking at? And I said, well, why don't you just bend over here and take a look, and I'll show you. It wasn't this that she was that I was looking at, but this was under the table. It was this that I was looking at. And I said, just look at that. Isn't that marvelous? And she said, I never would have imagined that was under the table. Well, there it is. So that's why I say, folks, look up, look down, look all around. Open your eyes, you know, take the time. You've got to remember this, that God never promised you another day. So if you don't look at it today, when you have the opportunity, you may not have it again. All kinds of wonderful collectibles. It's sort of like Wilderstein. Uh, the Aldridge's uh, and, and the Esther's, they didn't throw anything away. They kept everything and stored it nice and neat. We got the wonderful oriental vases here and spinets and uh, wonderful paintings. Beautiful, beautiful uh, wallpaper here. By the way, the lady that you see on the right hand of this portrait is uh, Laura Astor. Laura Astor married Franklin Hughes Delano, and they created a huge estate called Steen Valley next door. Some of the uh, chinaware in the house. This is a beautiful piece. Uh, if you look at it in the right angle, you can almost see through it when the light's reflecting behind it. It's just absolutely beautiful. Here we have the octagonal library that goes up three stories. 
You can see the fireplace has been well used. It's a little smoked up there. The books uh, are beautiful. They've all been read over and over again. And here's some of the landscape, uh, looking at the Catskill Mountains. Now we're down a little piece here lower, but the house is a little bit higher. And so uh, somewhere back in the 18, late 1800s, uh, the Astors decided they want better views of the river. And so they hired men to come in with wagons and shovels because there were no heavy duty equipment. And they cleaned off the top of that hilltop and carried it all away so we could have vistas down onto the waterfront. We have some of the wonderful old statuary that you used to see on these properties. I like the kid a little bit, folks. And this is kind of like one trying to hide his nakedness with a vine here. He's got kind of a sneer on his face, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And here's another one. And you can see the lichen is uh, on, on the statue. Here's one of the more pleasant ones. But uh, they're all looking uh, off in one direction. They're looking at this. <laughs> and I, I like to refer to her as a lady coming out of a Roman bath. And uh, unfortunately, she's lost her arm there, her hand. But uh, she's very, very beautiful. And so by looking at everything, always take in the garden pieces, the garden urns, uh, they're magnificent. They have wonderful things on them. Everything from people's heads to animal heads to uh, ancient figures. Mr. Aldridge told me that he thought this particular piece was bought from the Downing Estate in Newburgh when it was liquidated years ago. Here we have uh, some smaller ones, and you can see what I mean about all the wonderful figures and depicting various periods of time. The old iron benches sitting up against that beautiful big giant white pine tree. And this is one of the gazebas still remaining on the property. And here we have the bridge uh, across the railroad track. Uh, it goes out to where the yachts uh, came up the Hudson River and dock. They had their own private uh, uh, roadways from the riverfront up to the mansions. This one is still used. This is a picture of the house taken somewhere about 1890, I would say. And this is uh, William Backhouse Astor and his bride. That's quite a dress she's got on there. Now we're going to Ferncliff. Ferncliff uh, was built by William Astor. William Astor uh, was the son uh, of, of uh, uh, William Astor from Rokeby. Uh, uh, he created this estate by buying up small farms. The gatehouse is a little later vintage. It was put up in the 1870s, made out of bastard granite. Notice the iron gates are closed. If you go by there, if you've been going by there for 40 years, you have not seen them closed. Uh, they'll never close again, unfortunately. Uh, and we may even lose them because <clears throat> there's a building down there for sale that the nuns occupied when they, and when they sold the property. Uh, they put it on the market individually, and they're talking about putting a conference center back in there, and this is the only way down to it with a right away. and so they may, if they get their way, they may remove these beautiful gateways here. But they're absolutely magnificent. Look at the design in those gates. Here they are covered with snow. I always say God has a way of covering up man's dirt and, and iniquities and by putting a, a wonderful white coating on it. Now, this is how the gatehouse looked years ago. Uh, there's a big addition been put on where the screened in porches on the back. It's been complemented the house very nicely. And this is just one of the greenhouses uh, that's left on the property. There were uh, a couple of huge greenhouses. One had a big dome on it. There was a, a big statue uh, in the middle of the yard with a fountain there. They were done, uh, I, I believe, by Burnham and, and uh, Lord and Burnham, I believe, did the greenhouses. Anyway, if you were to take the main drive back, you cross this beautiful uh, granite stone bridge, and you'll notice uh, <clears throat> just over the bridge there's a, a gateway there now, because that's a private piece of property, about 35 acres, with a uh, uh, modern house that's been constructed on it. I'm not sure. I don't think they sold it. I think that they were asking something like $6.9 million when they put it on the market. But here's a side view of that bridge to show you how beautifully it's been constructed. And just envision the fact that this bridge was made uh, for horses and carriages. Going on up the drive, here's another carriage trail with another one of those bridges on it. And this is the Astor Mansion. When I read, it was built in 1874. It has a spiral staircase that runs from the uh, bottom floor of the basement all the way up into the tower. It really was used for a servant's uh, way to access the upper floors without being seen. 
And when I was a little boy, my father worked for Vincent Astor, and the mansion was still there. And uh, we used to come up here. Uh, my father told us we're not allowed up, up on the property, but we kids get together. We come up. We walked up onto those verandas and peeked through the windows, and the, everything was draped in white sheets, all covered. Nobody lived in it. Not too many photographs exist of the old mansion. These are taken from postcards. And uh, this was taken from Smith's History of Dutchess County. The house was remodeled in the year 1899. Stanford White, once again, was the architect in charge. We can meet in White. Stanford White was in charge here. They removed things like those uh, window hoods and uh, various uh, other features changing. And, and they completely redid the interior of the house. And this is the river uh, side of the house. That big, uh, on the left-hand side, the, the bottom floor was the uh, huge dining room and the smoking room. And up on the next level above it was uh, Mr. and Mrs. Astor's bedrooms. This particular photograph, believe it or not, I acquired from uh, Margaret Sookley's collection. They were very uh, gracious in allowing me to copy this photograph. And so it's one of the few photographs, actual photographs I have of the house. This came out of a, a catalog where they're trying to sell the estate, and it shows the, uh, when you walk through the main doors, the stairway, uh, I remember peeking through the windows and seeing it. But the only thing that's original here is probably the stone floor, uh, the various designs in the floor, because that's a, that's a new stairway. That, that whole interior was completely redone. Anyway, Andy Leibowitz bought the barn complex and, I don't know, about 175 acres of land and they were bulldozing to build a <coughs> shed to store equipment in and they started unearthing pieces of stone. And so Alan Newman was the architect that <coughs> was working for her and he asked me to come take a look and I said, that came from the uh, front entryway of the Astor Mansion, so this is obviously the uh, ruins of the mansion were buried right here. These beautiful gardens were all bulldozed at the same time. Uh, I walked through those gardens as a child. I saw the, the, the reflection ponds and all the floral. As a matter of fact, we used to pick the flowers and take them home to my mother. Uh, nobody really cared, you know. Uh, they just didn't live here. That's all there was to it. But anyway, if you sat on the veranda of the mansion and looked across the hilltop, you looked at what uh, they like to call the tennis house back in those days. It was also called by some people the casino. And today it's known as uh, Astor Court. Astor Court was designed by Stanford White. It was built in 1902-1903. It resembles, in my opinion, the, the Grand Trianon. That's what it looks like. Anyway, it boasted of the uh, wonderful indoor tennis here. It had a bowling alley, a shooting range, and uh, uh, other uh, things, accommodations for many guests. This is where Vincent Astor occupied the house uh, when he came to the country during those years. And this is what that court looks like today. We're standing on the balcony where visitors could sit and watch them play tennis. There is a mechanism to open that big skylight at the top, by the way. And this is a huge uh, leaded dome uh, in the main salon of the house. But anyway, Mr. Astor had this, uh, what was called the tea house built, a uh, pavilion built uh, just below the side of the mansion. The mansion stood in those trees on the right-hand side in the upper level there. They built that to memorialize it, and uh, it stood empty here for many years. And uh, uh, it uh, had a huge addition put on it about two years ago. Uh, you wouldn't recognize it today, and uh, I don't like to criticize too much, but it's an ugly, ugly modern house. And I think they were asking $6.9 million when I first saw it advertised. Mr. Astor had, I believe, three yachts during his uh, during the family's uh, lifetime, and this was the first one that they owned. And this was Vincent Astor's uh, last yacht, the yacht which he gave uh, to the war effort uh, during the Second World War. He traveled all over <coughs> all over the world with that uh, yacht. My father used to make butter in the creamery there on the estate, uh, and sometimes the of it were shipped, uh, were taken uh, into New York City to supply his hotels. And here's a picture, I believe that's probably uh, Vincent Astor's wife, but I, I'm not sure of that, I don't really know. Anyway, here's a, <clears throat> another picture of the same lady with someone with the same dog, who was standing on that front entryway. You see, it was, it was a huge mansion, you have no idea how big it was, and here we have someone in this side. And here we have Vincent Astor with his train. 
he had a couple of mile of track here, and he had this train. Uh, it had, it had a, a, a turntable you could turn it around on, and it was stored in a house, a building there. He could ride on that train, it was a toy. That's what, really what it was. And here we have the little stone cottage. It's the oldest house on the property. Uh, it was built back in the late 1700s. This is the house that I lived in with my family for about five or six years, and my father worked for Vincent Astor. It uh, sat empty for 30, 40 years uh, after Vincent Astor died, and uh, then it was put on the real estate market. There were trees growing up as high as the house when they cleaned off the front yard here eventually to sell it. Annie Leibowitz acquired all this property uh, a number of years ago, and uh, she renovated all these buildings and brought them back to life again. This building is completely redone. I've been through it, and uh, it was uh, partially gutted. The whole upstairs was gutted. <clears throat> there were extra windows and doors put on that side of the house that weren't there. And this is the vista of the barn. If you're going down the drive uh, into what was called Marion Rue, uh, you looked across the meadow at the barn. The barn is still there. This was taken in 1967. You can see the plaster uh, work here with the birds and so forth, the dark colors. The walls are covered with oil paintings. I believe Warren Delano uh, inherited the property from Franklin Hughes, and uh, I, I believe uh, he married one of the uh, Walters girls from, well, if you've been to, to uh, Baltimore, you've been to the Walters Gallery, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. This is how it looks today. You can see the new owners uh, found it this way and they restored it this way. It's very beautiful, but uh, the wonderful Victorian flavor is gone from it. Beautiful mantelpieces. Look at this one with the face in the center of it. Just think how someone sculpted that piece of marble and did all that work. To survive, fortunately, the ceiling in the breakfast room is still there. The painting is still there. The rest of it, all the red and, and other trim is just painted white today. But that particular painting is still there. This is the room now where the jacuzzi uh, is located. The mantelpiece is gone. All the wonderful Victorian flavor is gone. There were even gas lights on the walls in all these rooms yet. This is the day of the auction. I'll show you a few of the treasures. Uh, I've seen a lot of houses and I've seen a lot of contents. I've seen the Vanderbilts. And, mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I've seen them all, but I never saw one like this because this one was decorated mm -hmm. really back in that early period when they, when they started construction here back in the 1850s and up to the 1870s and kept acquiring paintings and things that they bought uh, in Europe and all over and just absolutely spectacular. I love this painting that's hanging over the bed in that room where the jacuzzi is. and. Uh, Look at the cat in the right-hand corner staring up at the bird in her hand. See, that's what I mean, folks, about opening your eyes and taking it in. Here we have these wonderful uh, pieces that are brought out on the front porch to, to be sold that day. And uh, those, those bigger ones, I said to the auctioneer, I, I don't know what they are, what are they? And he hung one up on, on a peg on, on the veranda and he said, uh, in case you don't really know what they are, he said, uh, they happen to be Della Roba. Well, you can imagine, and there it is. He put it up there to show me what it looked like. So these people had taste. They had real taste. Uh, look at these. There was a pair of these. Uh, I thought they were just beautiful out here in the yard. I saw uh, a pair of those uh, in the Victorian House Museum in Cortland. Some of the paintings that came out to be sold. Oriental carpets. That's Mr. Gilbert, old Rundle Gilbert, uh, showing it probably uh, to that man uh, to the right of him there. I like to imagine he's one of those Armenian carpet dealers uh, buying antique rugs. But look at the size of that rug. And it's an Oriental rug, so you know what it's worth. Look at these beautiful brass beds that came out someplace. And of course, I, I can't resist telling the stories. Here's this beautiful painting. A, a lady bought it that day. She bought two of them. I'm walking across the lawn. <clears throat> They're leaning against the tree. She's unlocking the door of her car. And uh, 
I snapped the photograph of the painting and she heard the camera click and she turned around and led into me and demanded I take the film out of my camera and give it to her. And I said, but madam, I have all these wonderful photographs and you know, I'm, uh, I'm just trying to capture history here. And we argued back and forth and finally she said, all right, I'll let you process the film, but I want the, the negatives or the transparencies that you have in your camera of this. She said, I know what you're up to. You're going to reproduce my painting. And I, I kind of laughed to myself because, you know, I, I, I photographed it in the house on the wall, you know, when they had the preview. But anyway, uh, I thought, okay. So she got her purse off the seat of the car and took out a little pad and a pen. And she said, what's your name? And I thought, gee, if it had been me, I would have said, let me see your driver's license. So I said, well, I gave her a phony name. <laughs> so then she said to me, and what's your address? Where do you live? Now, I've been photographing in the city of Newburgh for the Historical Society, and Urban Renewal was coming through, and there were some very bad neighborhoods. I popped the street with a, a, and gave her a number, and I gave her an old-fashioned John telephone number, and she wrote it all down. She said, when will the film be ready? And I said, that weekend. She said, I'll be calling you up. She said, I'm coming over to get it. And I often wonder, did she come to downtown Newburgh? <laughs> I know, folks, it wasn't a very nice thing for me to do, but I was very young at the time, and I wanted, I could not part with that photograph. Could not part with it. All right, just, just one more story for you. Look at this. <laughs> they brought this up out of the basement of the house, okay? And, and that was the day uh, of the preview sale. And they carried it up around to the front yard. Now, there's Mr. Gilbert, who was the auctioneer with his suit on, standing there. The work, workmen had wrecking bars, and they had to pry the top off of this. And when I saw the top come off, I looked at it, wow, and I popped this photograph. So what I'm not observing uh, so quickly is the fact that his workmen are hooking a hose up to the spigot on the front of the mansion. And then they stood it up, OK? Took her out. Her arm is broken off. It's, by the way, the arm is there. It's in the packing, OK? And so what they're about to do uh, is clean the statue off. And along comes this lady, and she's got on this red riding jacket, riding breeches, and uh, these big leather boots. And she had a little whip in her hand, and she's snapping it. And she said, Mr. Gilbert, what do you think you're doing? And he sarcastically said to her, Madam, what does it look like I'm doing? She said, it looks like you're about to use the water out of my well with my electricity, and you can't do that. <laughs> He tapped his vest pocket and very politely said, Madam, I've got a signed contract. I, I, I think he said the Morgan Guarantee Trust Company in New York to do as I want on said premises during said period of time. And he said to her, guess what I want to do now? And he raised his hand, snapped his finger. The workman turned on the spigot. The, the water came out the wash 100 years worth of dirt off of it. She went storming across the yard. And I'm not going to tell you what words were coming out of her mouth. But it was, and she was a beautiful lady. She was a very, very attractive lady. Well, then people, a crowd had gathered, and they said, Mr. Gilbert, who is that? He said, hmm, she thinks she owns the place. He said, she's the new, the new owner's mistress. So that's, that's the kind of the story that went with it anyway. But anyway, I, I said, why, why is the statue down in the basement? He said, it simply said it was shipped over here from Europe. When it got here, the arm was broken, so they put the top on it and put it in the basement. They didn't want it. It brought $400. Oh. This is Steen Valley today, folks. So now you know what I mean. Uh, it's a Georgian villa. It's very beautiful. You can see it's all lawn. It's all landscape. That's a pool house to the left. There's a big, uh, I think, 70-foot lap stake swimming pool. They have underground plumbing to uh, uh, water and fertilize the grasses uh, that grow on the, on the lawns, uh, many, many acres of it. And you won't find a, a blade of grass out of place. And uh, it's just absolutely spectacular uh, in, in the way it's cared for today. And uh, I'm very pleased with the family for uh, having taken such wonderful care of what they, what they acquired when they acquired it. They have, uh, people have different tastes today. And, and these people collect a lot of modern sculpture and art, which is fine, and because uh, that's very popular for some people today. But uh, kind of misses the old remnants of coming up the drive and seeing uh, the old statues and the Victorian flavor and the furniture. It's all gone. Anyway, the, the, the family all, this family also had their own private railroad crossing, as you can see. They had a big yacht. You know, it was the Walters yacht that came up here with the family. And they had what was called a flagpole uh, uh, lot. It had a huge flagpole. And if you walk down through Poets Walk today, when you stand there, you'll see the base of the pole. They cut it off, and uh, it's still there. And there's a bench there where you can sit. And you can walk down. The bridge is still there, but it's uh, not passable today. 
and uh, that's the flat top of the Catskills on the other side. And this is the Walters yacht, it was called the Narada. And this is how they came uh, up uh, to visit at the estate back in those days. So that's kind of the story, and uh, this is what seeing uh, Valley uh, looks like uh, back in those days. Very beautiful property, a very beautiful property. I love seeing Valley, and uh, I, I just think it's one of the most beautiful properties on the river. And I will tell you, I think the Hudson Valley is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And uh, I think it's all a gift of God. I like to put that in there because I think God created the mountains, the river, and he gave man the ability to create that house and all the antiquities that you see in it. He created the trees and, and uh, the life, the wildlife that's around there. So it's all God's creations. And so I remind you folks, as you travel and you leave here today, take your time, look around like I have during my lifetime, and open your eyes and take it all in because, you know, we're only here a short period of time. And uh, like I said, if you don't take it in today, you might not get that chance again tomorrow. So thanks so very much, folks, for all coming tonight. I hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs>